I hope you see my screen now. So also warm welcome from my side, uh, Jan Henrik Scheil. I'm advisor at the PTX Hub for uh, sustainability and certification. Before I start, a few words on our PTX Hub. We work as a knowledge and exchange platform and we support our countries, our partner countries in developing their own um, PTX and green hydrogen narrative. We do that by all kinds of knowledge dissemination that you can think of, by conducting studies, by commissioning studies, by providing training, uh, capacity building, and also by advising on PTX, uh, PTX policies and green hydrogen policies. We, have, we do that in a special way, so to say. We have 13 partner countries as the international PTX. And with these 13, 13 partner countries, we closely collaborate. And I mean, at least for the session here today, our most important partner country here is marked in red. What I want to do today is to give you an overview about the EU market. Why is this even relevant for uh, India, also for non-EU countries? Because I will talk a lot about EU policy. I want to give a quick overview on the delegated acts and their requirements, but I also want to focus on certification. What are the procedures in the EU and what is the status quo? So where are we at right now? And I hope that you can take away these main aspects I will demonstrate and what I think is important and will then come at the presentation afterwards, translate these requirements and yeah, put them into a context in India. This is very important, but let's start with uh, the introduction, so to say. So in the EU, there are several policies and quotas and there will come more. And these policies and quotas will need to be implemented by EU member states. And if these products for, come from economic operators, these products will need to comply with certain product requirements. And I will come to these product requirements with the Delegated Act. We have quotas. One example is um, the policy package of um, EU aviation. We have aviation quotas for sustainable aviation fuels and also a subquota for PTL, e-kerosene. And whenever these products shall be brought into the EU member states and shall be uh, counted towards these quotas, these products requirements that I will talk about, they become important. So these economic operators, these companies actually producing the fuels and selling these fuels, they can, they can come from Europe, yes, of course, but they can also come from outside of Europe. I put here India, not only India, of course, but you know what I'm, what I'm saying. So with these two delegated acts, we had this in the introduction already. The delegated acts are, so to say, policy amendment to this Renewable Energy Directive 2. And in these delegated acts, there are certain requirements of desc describing basically um, what is renewable hydrogen and what are renewable RFNBOs, so renewable fuels of non-biological origin, so to say a subgroup of PTX products. And one main message that I have is already here in this slide. So there are two delegated acts. The one for renewable electricity sourcing, delegated act on Article 27, and the one which is oftentimes a little bit forgotten, so to say, on GHG emission. So there is a GHG threshold that needs to be complied with as well. So we have renewable electricity and we have the GHG accounting. And again, this is applicable to EU internal production, but also outside. So whenever you want to bring a product into one of the EU member states, and want this product to be eligible under these quotas and policies, and the EU raised the ambitions very, very high, also in the last months and years. If you want these products to be accountable under these quotas, they need to comply with these requirements. This is the first delegated act. 
on renewable electricity sourcing. Whenever you actually read this document, I think it's a little bit hard to comprehend, but I think with this graphic, um, the basic logic is, is demonstrated. Also, I wanted to say upfront, I won't go into the details here now. Also, the International PTX app on our website, we will be publishing an in-depth briefing on these um, delegated acts in one week, two weeks time. The basic logic, however, is that there are different ways of how to prove that your electricity is actually renewable. Option one is a direct connection. So the solar park, the wind farm is directly connected with the electrolyzer, with the fuel producing unit. The other option is you use electricity from the grid. Here, there are uh, four sub options. Option 2A is about when there is a renewable grid. So 90% renewables in the grid, then it counts as renewable. Option 2B is about um, an electricity grid with low CO2 emissions, which is basically the case. And this was added actually uh, quite recently to the delegated acts, which is the case when you have a lot of um, nuclear, nuclear power in the grid. Option 2C is about imbalanced settlement periods. <coughs> Which is, which is basically uh, so option to see is basically about when there's too much electricity in the grid. And it's beneficial for the grid if you take this renewable electricity electricity market. Um, I still hear that noise, but uh, yeah, okay. Um, and the last option, option 2D, is about all other grid situations. So everything I said, put it aside, you just conclude, just in parenthesis, a power purchasing agreement. And then you have proof of renewable electricity. But just a PPA, just a power purchasing agreement is not enough. Here we have these colorful boxes at the bottom. In this case, you have to prove additionality, temporal correlation, and geographical correlation. These underlying requirements are basically there to really ensure that renewable electricity is added in the system. So what the EU Commission wants, don't want to happen is that renewable electricity is used for the hydrogen, for the renewable hydrogen, for the PTX, and then replaced by fossil electricity in the system. Therefore, we have this additionality, temporal correlation, and geographical correlation, in essence. Again, I won't go into detail, especially about geographical correlation. We will hear more in the following presentation. So this was the delegated act on article 27 about the renewable electricity i said in the beginning we also have another one about ghg accounting in essence you have to have a certain uh, saving 70 percent you see here on the right 70 percent in regard to a fossil fuel comparator which is also set in this renewable energy directive so you end at the, th uh, the threshold for your renewable hydrogen or your rfmbo at uh, 28.6 grams CO2 equivalent per megajoule. And in this nice supply chain I have here, I wanted to demonstrate how this is actually calculated. So you start at the renewable electricity here, at the wind park, at the solar park, and with each step, you go through the supply chain, and with each step, you calculate the emissions. EP is your emissions for processing. You add ETD, which is transport and distribution and you go through the supply chain step by step and add the emissions for each aspect um, that you yeah that your fuel basically covers uh, on the way to the final product um, what is not included here is infrastructure as you see here <laughs> close to the ship at the bottom so this means you don't need to calculate emissions for um, building the wind park or building the electrolyzer or building uh, any other infrastructure that's related um, to it. So this is not included. However, again, the 70% threshold 
is really important and you need to comply with both. You have to have proof of this renewable electricity, as I mentioned it, and the GHG savings. Also, I know that this methodology sounds super complicated. It is not new. It has been used in RD1 and RD2. It has been used for over 10 years. And now we have some new amendments, so to say, for the hydrogen PTX context. So let's sum this up visually. Again, we have our uh, little here supply chain, PTX supply chain, and let's look about where we have actually sustainability criteria in these delegated act requirements. I mentioned renewable electricity sourcing. This is very, very important, and a lot of emphasis is put on this. I didn't mention CO2 source. CO2 source, there are also some aspects in the delegated acts. You can read this in our briefing, which we'll publish later. Um, but as the logic behind the CO2 source is not which CO2 source is eligible. So you can use DAC, you can use biological, you can use, I don't know, point sources from a cement plant. The logic is not eligible, not eligible. The logic is within the GHG accounting. So when can you actually receive a benefit in the GHG accounting? And this is basically here true for the whole supply chain. Another sustainability criteria, as I said, as I mentioned in the second delegated act, the GHG counting also needs to be done and needs to be, um, yeah, needs to be demonstrated, so to say. So this was a short overview uh, on the um, what? What are the requirements? But now I'd like to come to the how. How is this actually proved? And um, also in the past, also with the RD1 and 2, especially in the topic of biofuels, there is already a certification setup, as I call it, where you have different actors fulfilling different roles in a whole certification approach. And this graphic demonstrates basically where, uh, how this works. And this approach will also be applicable to hydrogen. And for the last bit now, I would like to go through each of these uh, actors that we have and explain a little bit their function, what they're doing. So, oh, this is actually one first point I need to mention here, the regulatory body. The regulatory body is in this case, the EU Commission, which sets the sustainability criteria, if you wanna call them like that, and the regulatory framework. This is what I talked about, the delegated X. This is set by the regulatory body, the EU Commission in this case. Then we have voluntary schemes. And these voluntary schemes, they actually yeah, translate this regulatory framework into a certification approach, as I call it. They set the certification framework, they set audit criteria and practically apply these requirements. These voluntary schemes, are private individuals, can be organizations, and uh, are developed in a multi-stakeholder process usually. So being involved also with NGOs, with private companies, it's uh, um, to have an inclusive process, so to say. And they receive recognition from the European Commission. So they are officially recognized to be allowed to certify these products. They have additional functions, which I, don't need to go into detail now. And I also wanted to demonstrate some examples here on the far right. For example, ISCC, RSB, and RedCert are certification schemes that actually do already certification under the RD2, for example, for biofuels. And they are, let's say, already recognized from the European Commission. However, they are not recognized yet for the hydrogen, for the delegated act part of it. This is something that needs to come still. And, but there are also potential other volunt uh, voluntary schemes who would, would like to become recognized for certifying renewable hydrogen and RFNBOs under the RD2 Delegated Act criteria. We have your Certify, TÜV Rheinland, TÜV Süd, and also the Green Hydrogen uh, Standard with, uh, from the Green Hydrogen Organization. However, these are not yet recognized under the, uh, under the RD2 um for uh, let's say biofuels or products which can now be sold but i'll come to the status quo in the end certification bodies have a special function they um actually do the audits 
they are the third party verifier, so to say. So it wouldn't it wouldn't make much sense if they were to if the certification, the voluntary schemes set the rules and also do the audits. No, we have your third party verification by so-called certification bodies, and they are actually the ones issuing the certificate in the end. Yeah, I also have some examples. And I put this extra, but of course they belong together. Certification bodies have auditors who then do site specific audits. So at the electrolyzer, for example, they do audits at the Fisher Tropsch or the Haber Bosch synthesis plant. And they do the audits and actually check, for example, is um, the GHG emissions, are they calculated correctly? And then also most importantly, you can say they are the system users, as I call them. They are the companies who are actually seeking certification. They are called system users because they use the certification system, so to say. And they, in the end, they initiate the whole process because they seek certification. And uh, the way it works is that they can choose a voluntary scheme. So um, there are many voluntary schemes, as I mentioned. I think for biofuels right now, there are uh, 15 actually recognized. So they can actually choose a voluntary scheme. And the voluntary scheme has a list of certification bodies with whom they can cooperate. And then the whole process, so to say, is initiated. And I won't go into much detail with accreditation bodies. It's another level of verifying, so to say. Accreditation bodies um, verify the competence of the certification bodies. They say this certification body XYZ is able to conduct audits and to conduct uh, the specific criteria. And one in the EU, there's this uh, rule that each member state has one official accreditation body. That's why you see here examples for different countries. So I've mentioned these actors and what their role is. Um, but in the end, I want to have a quick look on what is the status quo? Where are we at? And I do this with this little uh, traffic light image here. Regulatory body. We are quite there, as I said. The delegated acts we heard in the beginning as well are adopted. Now the council and the parliament has actually two months to veto it. I think they're almost done now, these two months. They actually still have a bit more time, but we are very, very likely to see these versions of the delegated act also as the final ones. The voluntary schemes, of course, they followed this whole discussion with all the leaks, everything that has been gone for almost one and a half years now. And I would say, with the voluntary schemes I talk to, they have their system, their certification system for these delegated acts, their certification approach. They have it almost ready, or even they have it ready. But as I said, they need to be recognized again in this process. So they have to demonstrate their certification approach to the commission. And then the commission says, okay, you are recognized and then certification can actually happen. So also in yellow, close, but not quite there. And I mentioned certification, but they cooperated with uh, voluntary schemes to do pilot audits. So there are some tests running how, how this can be proved. But again, as this is not officially uh, done yet, we are almost there, but not yet. And this is the status quo. I hope I could give you um, yeah, a bit of an overview. And um, yeah, thank you very much.